Jesus. The only one that can fix it. And uh, we need to really keep seeking him and asking him to have grace and mercy uh, upon our communities and across our land and to heal the brokenness that seems to be spreading around the world. So keep that in mind. Uh, a couple other things. I, uh, there's a couple of birthdays in here. Uh, Rita's only 19. <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> and, and Clara, uh, she's uh, uh, just a young lady. Uh, uh, only 16. Okay, there you go. All right. Happy birthday, guys. Uh, it's, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, keep in mind uh, uh, each night at the park will be our uh, revival uh, starting at 630. So uh, keep that uh, in your prayers, asking God to bless that and, and uh, to use it uh, in our community. Amen. Any other things we need to share with one another this morning? Charlotte, how's your brother-in-law? Uh, okay. I'll bet he was glad to be home. Amen. Amen. Any other things we need to share, good news or prayer requests or anything that we need to remember? Who? Oh, are you Emma? Are you Emma? <laughs> All right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, amen. Any other things we need to share? Oh, good, 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 good. All right. Amen. Well, Let's get ready to prepare to receive communion this morning. And uh, as we uh, do that, ask God to touch your hearts and, and uh, work powerfully in your life. Reading in 1 Corinthians, the uh, 11th chapter in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, it, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's join together in prayer and, and uh, uh, ask God to refresh you, forgive you, cleanse you, set you apart as vessels that would bring glory and honor to Him. And be in thanksgiving as we remember how much He loved us and the sacrifices He made that we might have life and have it in its abundance. Father, we come before Your presence this day. Father, thank you that we can be in remembrance of your love, that we can be in remembrance of your grace, that we can be in remembrance of the tremendous sacrifice that, that was made at the cross of Calvary. Thank you that the sacrifice was made, that he bore the stripes on his back, that we could be made whole and complete, that we could be healed. And Father, thank you that the blood was shed on the cross of Calvary, that paid the penalty of our sin. And thank you that we can have forgiveness, that we can have cleansing, that we can be set apart as people that bring glory and honor to you. Father, as we prepare to take the bread and the drink of the cup, may we do it with thanksgiving, and may we do it with praise and glory and honor as we remember the demonstration of your love. Bless the cup and bless the bread, and we give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you'll stand with me, and guys, you can start. Uh, Carolyn, if you'll lead the, the, the group. Okay, come by and take the bread and the cup and come back to your seat, and then we'll do it together, okay?
we prepare to receive the bread and the cup. You know, the scripture says we can cast all our cares on him. I think as we gather around the communion table, it reminds me of how much he cares, how much he loves me. So as we receive the bread and the cup this morning, cast your cares. Cast your weaknesses and your faults upon him and allow him be, to be the God that's more than enough. This received the bread and cup in the name of Jesus. Well, this morning, uh, I titled this message, No Need to Be Troubled in Heart in Troubled Times. I, I want you to think about that title, No Need for a Troubled Heart in Troubled Times. I think if we were honest, all of us have had times when our hearts have been troubled. All of us have had times when life really seemed pretty difficult. And uh, I want you to turn with me to John, the 14th chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6, a very familiar passage of Scripture. And it starts with, let not your heart be troubled. And uh, uh, a setting that Jesus was dealing with his disciples, knowing that they had troubled hearts, knowing that they were confused, knowing that they didn't understand what was taking place. And so he speaks to them to try to deal with the troubled heart and try to give them direction and restore a, a, a faith that would take them through uh, the difficulties of life. Let's read this passage of Scripture. You can follow along. Starting with verse 1, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I, I want to uh, uh, put a little footnote there. In my Father's house, there's plenty of room. Okay? Keep that in mind. In my Father's house, there's plenty of room. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And wouldn't you say he had a little bit of a troubled heart and a little bit confused at what was going on? And Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the lie. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, I want you to ask God to give you the ability this morning to hear uh, through the working of the Holy Spirit and to have wisdom to respond with an action faith. I want you to just begin to pray and say, God, I, I need ears to hear. I, I need your wisdom. And I, I need faith that, that has action to it, that I can respond and allow God to remove my troubled heart, remove any fears or any doubts that might be trying to raise uh, uh, up in my life. I read this thing, it said uh, on one Sunday, the, the preacher went a little longer than normal. This is for Jerry, okay? And after the service, people went by the preacher tired and exhausted. We're not going to do that, okay? One of them went up to him and told him, Your sermon reminded me about the peace of God and the love of God. The preacher was very excited that at least someone found comfort in his sermon. So he asked him to tell him more about how he found peace of God and the love of God in this sermon. Well, the man said, I found the peace of God in your sermon because it passed all understanding. And I found the love of God in your sermon because it endured forever. <laughs> So, uh, I hope you find some <laughs> peace of God and, and the love of God this morning as I, I share this message with you. I want you to give you three key thoughts. I want you to keep these thoughts with you and uh, 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 listen because we'll pick up these three key thoughts periodically through this message. And I want you to hear the troubled hearts, and we're going to talk about troubled hearts. But we're going to talk about trusting in God, that we need to have a trust, a faith, a confidence, an assurance 
that God is with us, that God will help us, God that will enable us to deal with the issues of life, and then focus on the greatness of God. How many believe God is great? Amen. He's a great and mighty God. Amen. And we need to have that. You know, as I share this message, we live in a very uncertain times. Everywhere I turn, in print, on the news, or on the social media, everyone is talking about the coronavirus. It seems like that has been, you know, there's not a news broadcast. It's coronavirus is, it is not mentioned. And you know, fear seems to be rising around the world. I don't know whether you've noticed uh, the reports in Illinois, but Illinois, it, we're going the wrong way right now on, on people catching the virus. And, and uh, I think, uh, what, 26 counties here in the southern part of Illinois are on the warning list. And uh, the situation seems to be getting more difficult than better. You know, who had ever dreamed that, that you know, places would be shut down? Uh, uh, you can't go in a restaurant to eat. Who had ever dreamed that, you know, events are being canceled and all of these different things? And who had ever dreamed that we'd run out of toilet paper? I mean, uh, can you imagine that? You run out of toilet paper. I, uh, you know, and I don't know whether you've noticed, if you go in the stores, a lot of shelves are empty. And it amazes me. And, uh, uh, you know... A lot of uncertainty, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things, questions being done. But, you know, in uncertain times, the Bible assures us that there are truths that we can hold on to that will steer us through these uncertain times, that will help us deal with the issues of life. John 14 happens to be one of those passages. Because as I shared with you, when Jesus sat down with these disciples, they were facing troubled times. They did not understand what Jesus was trying to say to them. They only could observe what they had seen. And he was trying to transition them from what they could see to what they could sense in their spirit. What they could experience through the truth of God's word. So I want you to listen very closely and realize that when he says, I am the way. How many of you believe he is the way? Amen. And he is the way to the heavenly father. And I love when he talks about his heavenly father. He says, my father and my father's house. And he talks about preparing something great that will help us not focus on the greatness of the problem, but how about on the greatness of God? And how about focusing on how good God is and how much God loves us and how much God has made a way where there seems to be no way. Can you imagine at the cross of Calvary, the devil thought he was winning, but God was leading us in a way of victory that we could be overcomers in this old sin-sick world. Isn't that good news? Now, I want you to think about that as we, we go through this. You know, uh, I, I was reading an article and, uh, you know, uh, Sometimes directions can be complicated. You ever notice that? Uh, you know, why we have went to these uh, runarounds, or what, runabouts, or whatever they call them things. Uh, now, I'm telling you, yeah, you look at the marks on the, all the way around that runaround, a lot of people are confused. They're, they're up in the center, they're all around, and, and you know, uh, I seen a guy make three trips around one the other day trying to figure out which one he was going to get out on. Yeah. And uh, have you ever been to the airport? And, you know, if you've been to the airport lately, they, you know, they're, they're steering you every which way, and they've got signs this way, this way. And, you know, if you want to get there, you've got to know the way. You've got to follow the signs. Isn't that true? And this is what Jesus was saying to the disciples. I, you know, don't be troubled in heart. I've got a plan. I've got a design. I'm the way, and you will trust in me. I'll take you to my Father's house. And I'll take you to a place that will astonish you beyond your wildest imagination. And if you focus on that, he says, you'll find a peace that passes all understanding. You know, when you think about it, it's tough sometimes. It's tough dealing with issues. It's tough dealing with life. It's tough dealing with circumstances. But I want you to know that if we'll learn the truths of God, and we'll hear the voice of the Spirit of God. God will literally take us through. And that was the thing he was trying to get to the attention of the design. Because you know what? They wanted to stay in the physical realm. I can't imagine. Can you imagine with me what it would have been like 
walking day by day with Jesus. Can you imagine being with him? And he goes into a village, and the whole village empties out, and they come, and they bring their sick, they, they bring their lame, they bring their, you know, all the problems. And I mean, with a word, they're made whole. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine, you know, uh, being in that type of situation? And that's all they could see, but Jesus was saying, hey, I'm going back to the Father because I've got better things in store, more than just what you've experienced. I've got to go back to the Father, and I'm preparing a place. And if I'm preparing a place, I'm going to come back, and where I am, you're going to get to be there also. Amen? So what I wanted us to do this morning, you know, uh, how many of you believe he's a shelter in the storm? How many of you believe that he's a refuge and uh, that he's a fortress and he's a strong tower of safety? And, and how many realize the devil can't penetrate those areas? Amen? And so I want you to think, but listen to what it says in Isaiah, and, uh, or actually this do Deuteronomy 31.6. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble, for the Lord your God goes with you and he will not fail you or forsake you. How many of you believe that? You know, just think about the setting where we're at. You know, uh, we've never been here before. We've never encountered what we're encountering. The world has never encountered this to this magnitude. You know, whoever dreamed that, that you would be listening to the news every night and they're talking about how many deaths, how many people have been diagnosed with it, and all of these different things in the effect upon our communities and our society. And we're not talking about just in Illinois or the United States. We're talking about around the world, okay? And, and, and so these are, but this look to God because he says, be courageous and be bold and don't be afraid because we need to trust and Lean upon Almighty God. You know, I know, uh, uh, Carolyn and I have had a little taste of this coronavirus with Kimmy coming down with it, and thank the Lord that she had, you know, a, a mild case of it and, and, and went through it uh, without any complications or problems. But I want you to understand, and I want you to listen about God. How many of you believe God has a way for us? That God is that shelter. God is that plan. I, and, you know, I don't understand. I'd like to tell you, and I've sought God. I'd like to tell you I've got all the pieces put together of where we're at in this coronavirus. But I, I, I've got to be honest. I, I, I've struggled in trying to put. But what I've determined, and I want you to think about this. When he says, let not your hearts be troubled. This think about how great our God is. This think about how God has done uh, in the Bible in the past, and how God has become a shelter, how God has made a way when it looked like it was impossible. And God had a plan. How many of you believe God's got a plan? You know, I, uh, I told Carolyn, and this is just a little added. I want you to pray about this. I want you to think about this. I really believe that the devil is the devil of deception. I believe the Bible says he's a liar from the beginning. I believe that he tries to deceive the elect if it's possible. I believe that he's out to try to trip up Christianity, to try to silence the voice of Christianity. And here we are, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of a coronavirus. And, you know, he's come in the back door, and if we're not careful, he's going to shut our churches down. If we're not careful, you know, you know if I told Charlie that he had to take the mark of the beast, Charlie would fight me like a tiger. Okay, but here the devil come in in deception, and he's coming in the back door, and we're acting like it's a, a real good thing to do to not have church. We've come to the decision, well, we've got to do the right thing. Let me tell you, the right thing is we better seek God in this. The right thing is that we better be persuaded that God can take us through this thing and bring us out victorious on the other side, and I see the church shutting down. And they're acting like it's a good thing they're doing. It's not a good thing. If it shuts the churches down, we're in trouble, folks. So you need to keep that in mind. And I told Carolyn, I said, I've been seeking God on this. And all of a sudden, God spoke to my heart. And he said, he's a devil of deception. And don't let him deceive you. I don't know about you, but I need worship. I need fellowship. I need the support of the family of God. And if we lose that, we're in trouble. And I believe the devil's done a deceptive thing to come in the back door and shut us down. 
or try to shut us down. Amen? Pray about that. That's just a little bit of revelation that God spoke to my heart. But I want you to understand, I know this, and I want you to listen to this. I want you to believe that as you go back, how many realize this is a great history book? Hmm? How many realize it's a great story book? How many realize that this Bible tells us one story after another of how God becomes a shelter and how God becomes a shield of protection, how God becomes a fortress, how God's ways are much higher and much better than my ways? How many believe that? You see, if you read the book, if you get into the book, you'll discover this. Just listen to this a moment. God sheltered Noah and his family for one year in the ark until he emerged to become the father of the nations of the world. Pretty heavy shelter, isn't it? Pretty heavy way to be protected. I, 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 I was overwhelmed. God sheltered Jacob in a home of his uncle Laban when he needed to escape the wrath of his brother Esau. Twenty years later, Jacob emerged with a new family, with new wealth, and guess what? New identity, he became Israel, the name of God's chosen people. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Hmm? I mean, you can go through these, and what you find, that God had us a shelter, even in the most difficult time. Can you imagine when Jonah was in the well of the bell, or, or, or in the belly of the whale, or the big fish, whatever you want to call it? Three days. And guess what? God spoke to his heart. He got spit upon the, the shore, went and done what he'd done, and had the greatest revival of the known time. Wow. Don't you think we need to ask God to give us ears, to trust in him, that God can make a way where there seems to be no way, that when you read these history stories of what God has done, can you imagine? Here's the one that got me. Paul was in prison in Rome and in a tough situation. But listen, he wrote most three or four of the most important books of the New Testament while he was there. Pretty heavy, isn't it? That God began to work away and make a way. How about Jesus? He laid in the tomb for three days, but God raised him from the dead, and guess what? He's the Savior of the world, and we need to put our trust in him. Amen? I mean, I could, we could spend the rest of the service going through these history stories and realizing what God has done, that he is a shelter, that he makes a way. Can you imagine Esther? While in the palace of the Persian king, she saved her people from destruction. Can you imagine that? I mean, how many stories that God... Here's a good one for the ladies. It said, God sheltered Naomi in the barren land of Moab until she nearly became bitter, but she and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, traveled to Bethlehem to participate in one of the greatest love stories of history. How do you like that? Isn't that pretty cool? I mean, the list could go on and on, but what I want you to see is that God has an answer for troubled hearts. God has a way where it seems like there's no way, and sometimes His wisdom and His ways are much better than us, and if we'll trust Him, guess what? We'll come out victorious on the other side. Is that not true? I mean, that's way of the life of serving the Lord and trusting in Him, that we have to trust in Him and keep our trust. Can you imagine this? Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going away, and I'm going to my Father's house. And in my Father's house, now let, I want you to hear this. In my Father's house, it says in a lot of the trans, many mansions, okay? But I want you to think about it, in my Father's house, there's plenty of room. And you know what I want to tell you? In the next few moments, we're going to talk about the Father's house. But I want you to have ears to hear. I want you to have a heart to respond. And I want you to realize if you'll focus on what Jesus is saying about there's plenty of room in my father's house. As old Dr. D.E. King said in a sermon, he was my professor, one of my professors when I was in seminary. He said, I'm going to preach about the father's house. And when I get done... When I finish talking about the Father's house, I guarantee you, you'll want to come in. And I guarantee you that you'll want to sit down and stay forever. I never forget that. And when he got done preaching that day, 
They was Baptist seminary students shouting. They kicked us out, chairs out of the way, and they were praising God. You'd have thought we was having a Holy Ghost revival in the seminary. Why? Because a man who believed in what he was preaching, he believed that in the Father's house, it was a place prepared beyond our wildest dreams and our wildest imagination. He believed it was a place that if you stayed focused on it, you wouldn't have a troubled heart. You know, how many of you realize we're pilgrims? We're on a journey. This world is not my home. My home is where Jesus has been preparing for 2,000 years, a marvelous home. And you know what? I don't know about you, coronavirus, chaos across the world, all of the burning and all of the rioting and all of the things. You know what it says? In these last days, you'll have troubled times. In these last days, it's going to be difficult to be a Christian. In family will turn against family. In these last days, people will be selfish and greedy, demanding their own rights, not caring for anybody but their sales. We're there. We're approaching it. Time's running out. It's time to sound the alarm and wake up. And so this is my message to you. I want to talk about this dwelling place, this place that God has prepared. Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, I, <clears throat> I will make he who overcomes I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on his, uh, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write uh, uh, on him my name. And can you imagine this? I, I want you to catch in mind. We're not talking about just heaven here. We're talking about the new Jerusalem. And this new Jerusalem is going to come down out of heaven. This new Jerusalem is unbelievable as we look and realize what Jesus said, I am preparing a place for you. I am preparing something that is beyond your wildest imagination. It will come down out of the sky. It will be a dwelling place for the family of God. Can you imagine this and how special this place is? Are you ready to... Listen to the dimensions and listen to the quality of this place. And here, I want you to understand, it's important to realize that the New Jerusalem is not heaven, but it is the capital city of heaven. Think about that. It's the capital city of heaven. And it says in Revelation 21, and take your Bible there and go to verse 1. And just read about this capital city. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw this holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and there will be no... Uh, uh, with them, and they'll be no uh, uh, and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have pa passed away. And then he sat down on, and then he sat on the throne and said, "Behold, I make all things new." And he said to me, "Write, for these words are true and faithful." We must know the truth. You see, the description implies that the holy city was designed, built, and ready, and made for the new earth and new heaven. Can you imagine, as I, we talk about this, there's a new city, new Jerusalem, made and waiting for the word to be pronounced, for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, for this new city to come down out of heaven. You know, I, I begin to work on this, and I begin to think, wow, how to describe this in a sermon? So this is a trial run. Are you ready? And I want you to think that as we look at these last two chapters of the book of Revelation, 
that he begins to give us the dimensions of this new city, the description of this new city, but also I want you to hear, and you need to hear this, a warning about the one thing that could keep you out of the city. Are you ready? Would you like to know? Now, here's what I want to understand. Revelations 21, 15, and 16. And it says, He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth, and the measure and measure the city with a reed. 12,000 furloughs, its length, breadth, height are equal. In today's terms, that means New, New Jerusalem. All right, are you ready for this? It's 1,500 miles, not heaven. New Jerusalem, the city, is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, and 1,500 miles tall. We're talking about a city, not heaven. We're talking about the capital. Can you imagine that? Let me help you get an understanding of that. If you would divide North America in half, right down Chicago, right up into Canada, right on down to the Gulf, half of the North America would be the size of the city. Half of North America, not heaven. Now, do you get the picture when he says, in my father's house, there's plenty of room, okay? Now, let me stagger your mind. It's 1,500 miles tall, okay? 1,500 miles tall. Can you imagine this? We're, we're, we're talking to 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles width, depth, height. 1,500 miles. Now, h- half as big as North America. Now, I want you to keep another thought in. This, uh, I, I, matter of fact, I had Larry and Ann on the phone last night because I could not comprehend all of the figures that was running through my mind as I'd been working on this. But I want you to keep in mind that you take the city of London, one of the larger cities in the world. The city of London is only four square miles. You understand? Only four square miles. So if you take one layer of the city, one layer that's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, you could put 70 times the world population based off of the size of uh, London as being an example. We're talking about, what, uh, I've got my figure. I think uh, uh, there's 8 billion people in the world. And that first layer, based off of the dimension, would ha- handle 70 times 8 billion. Is there plenty of room in the Father's house? Is there plenty of room? In- now, some engineers said, okay, it's 1,500 mile high. So let's say we have mile-high ceilings, layers. So you've got 1,500 layers. So you take 1,500 times the billions, what did I say, I think it's 560 billion on the first floor. And so you take that times 1,500, and we got up in the, how many zeros did we get, Ann? Ten zeros in the trillions. In the trillions. Are you grasping this? I mean, can you imagine when Jesus said, in my Father's house, it's better than a cabin in the corner of glory land, let me tell you. In my Father's house, there's plenty of room. Trillions of room. Can you imagine that? Can you, I mean, how would you like to have been John? And he saw this city coming out of the heavens. Now, how great is our God? How great is our God? Can we trust a God that has designed something like that? I ought to hear a great amen out of that, amen? I mean, can you imagine in our mind? Me and Carolyn worked with this all week, and and she says, I just can't fathom what you're talking about. Just how big that holy city is and how great it is. But now, that's just the dimensions of the holy city. Can you imagine the new heaven and the new earth? And this thing's coming down out of the heavens. And you know... Can you imagine the beauty of that? I, I showed Carolyn a picture. I, was, I, I wish I'd had time to put the slide. But it took all the stones that's mentioned that's in the wall of the city, and it had a picture of all those stones, the colors, and had a wall, and it, it, it was radiating. It, and it was absolutely beautiful. 
Can you imagine what John was encountering in that? But listen to this. Let's talk about the city a minute. Because when you talk about the city, the city is a holy city. It said holy Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. You know what the Bible talks about in the Wycliffe commentary? A holy city be, will be one with no lies ever told. A holy city will be one that no evil will be spoken. A holy city will be where there's no shady business deals. Let me tell you what else it'll be. It'll be a holy city because it will be filled with God's people who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and made righteous through Christ Jesus. Amen? And you know what that means? There'll not be any writing in the holy city. There won't be any burning of businesses in the holy city. There won't be any people rioting and tearing and destroying. And let me tell you what, you'll discover that God says all human beings are important to Him. Amen? You'll discover that it is a holy place that God has been preparing for all of these years and He's made plenty of room to come in. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe and trust in a God that's greater than our wildest imagination, greater than our wildest thought, a God that has designed a holy city that we can be there and we can enjoy the benefits of it. Amen? Now, get this one. It says, the gates are a pearl. Can you imagine that? The gates are pearls. 1,500-mile wall. 1,500-mile wall. You know, one person made the statement. They said, wow, what kind of, uh, what is it, Archer? Couldn't make a pearl like that. I love the guy rescued him. He said, it wasn't the Archer. If God wants a pearl, he could speak it, and it could be made. How many of you believe that? Because he could speak the world into existence. He can speak, and they could be a made of pearl. But now, listen to this part. I want you to hear this. How many of you ever remember, uh, uh, let me find it here, uh, uh, remember W.A. Criswell? Anybody remember W.A. Criswell? W.A. Criswell was the pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas. It was the largest church back then around the world. And W.A. Criswell was one unbelievable preacher. And uh, uh, he went on to be uh, uh, with the Lord in glory. But listen to what Dr. Criswell had to say uh, about the gates of pearl. He says he preached, uh, that there was a sermon, in fact, that, uh, on the gates of pearl. And here's what he said. He says, because heaven is entered through suffering. Now think about this. Heaven is entered through suffering, travail, and through redemption, and through the shedding of the blood, through the agony of the cross. A pearl is a jewel made by a little animal that is wounded, and without the wound, there is no pearl to be farmed. And when we walk through the gates of this holy city, we will be reminded that Jesus loved you so much that he was tortured, he was beaten almost to death. He carried a cross all the way to Calvary. And he died on that cross. He suffered on that cross. He suffered the humility. He suffered the mockery. He suffered it all. That you and I could have a city to dwell in where it was a holy city. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that, guys? Can you imagine that God would love you that much that he would send his son to suffer and die? that you and I might be made whole. Now listen to this. I'm going to, for sake of time, I'm going to go to the last part, okay? These are trial runs. I'm going to preach this to the best of my ability and the best of the anointing of God on, on Monday night. But I want you to think about this last part. And I've jumped way ahead. But the denial to the city. I thought we needed to talk about that a moment. The denial. I hate to end on a negative, but it can be a positive. But I want you to go back, and I want you to read Revelations 21 and 22 when you get home. In Revelations 21, verses 7 and 8 says, He who overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, 
the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderer, the sexually immoral, the sorcerer, the adulterer, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. I want you to understand, guys, there's a glorious place called heaven, and we've only talked about the capital city, but there also is a horrible place called hell. A horrible place, and without being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, without seeing Jesus Christ as the way, without believing with the depths of your heart and surrendering your life, there's no entrance into this holy city. Listen what it continues to say in Revelation. Revelation 21, 25, and 27. Its gates shall not be shut all day, and there shall, and there shall be, I put that, there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of nations into it. But there shall be no mean, uh, by no mean, but there shall by no means enter anything that defies or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the book of the Lamb of Life. Then the last one, Revelation 20 through 14 through 15, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, that they may enter through the gate into the city, but outside are dogs, saucers, sexually immoral, murderers, adulterers, and whoever loves and practice lies. Now, does that mean if you lie, you are not going to go to heaven? No, what it means if you've never been forgiven of your sins. What it means if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. What it means if you've never come to a point that you realize that you were a sinner that you have missed the mark of God in your life, and that you are lost and doomed without Jesus. Let me tell you, repentance is so important in the plan of salvation. You need to admit you're a sinner, but you need to re repent and say, God, I have sinned against you, and I need to be forgiven. I need to have you as my Savior. I need to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I need to put my trust in you. And let me tell you something else. When you put your trust in Him, you need to look to Him on this journey because on this journey, you will have troubled hearts. You will have troubled times. But how many of you believe He is a shelter in the storm? Amen? He is a shelter in the storm. And when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we accept Him, we are blood-bought, we are the redeemed of God. Amen? And let me tell you what, folks. The wake-up call needs to be sounded. The alarm needs to be sounded. We are marching down the home stretch. Amen? We are marching. I really believe that Jesus, when he says, I stand at the door, I believe he's standing at the portals of heaven, and he's looking to the Father, and he's waiting for the Father to say, the time is right. And in the twinkling, in the blink of an eye, he'll raise us from the grave. He'll catch all of those who have went on before. Meet them in there, and we who are alive. Can you imagine that reunion? Can you imagine that? And he's going to take us into the holy city. And we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Wow. Wow. Can you even begin to fathom that? Wow. I mean, can you imagine that? I've, I've worked on this sermon for about a month now. I told Jeff yesterday, I said, I've got to narrow down 25 pages to a, about a 30-minute sermon Monday night. But I want you to understand when he said, let not your hearts be troubled. If my God loves me that much... And he's been preparing this place. And it's bigger than my mind can even begin to comprehend. And you know what? I've preached for almost 50 years. And you know what's going to be in the center of this holy city? The tree of life. And all of these trees that were in the Garden of Eden. And all of these fruits that I've preached that you ought to partake of. The love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the goodness. Ending up with Christ's control. Guess what? They're going to be our daily diet. Can you imagine that? You just walk down that street of gold, and you can pick fruit. You can drink of the river of life. And you know, I looked up, it was interesting. When it talks about that, a word it uses that we get the word therapeutic. You know, when you end up getting a, uh, you know, a massage or therapeutic. But can you imagine 
You're a child of God. You're living in this holy city, and, and it's 1,500 miles tall, and, and you know you can bleak your eye and be at the last layer. But then God says, you know what? You'll probably need a little therapeutic along the way, so just come by the river and stick your feet in for a while. Come by and pick you a little fruit and, and just be refreshed in the love of God. Be refreshed in the joy of God. Can you, can you begin to fathom that? I can't. Well, but the bottom line is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? That's the key. That's the entryway. And so Jesus told those disciples, he said, man, I'm going away, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And if I go away, I'm coming back. And where I am, you'll be there. You know what he said in Acts 1? The angel said, he said, as you've seen him going up, you'll see him coming back, and you'll go with him. Pretty heavy, isn't it? Hmm? Our young daughter, Kimmy, when she was little, I preached a revival on the second coming, and she pulled her mom off, and she said, Mom, Mommy, I don't know how to fly, but can I hold your shoulders? Well, it'll be an instant flight lesson because we'll be transformed. And we'll meet him in the sky. Can you imagine when the saints go marching in? Well, oh, I want to be in that number. Let's stand together, guys. Hmm. Wow. You know, we did the Lord's Supper, and it says, let a man examine himself. Let a person examine himself. You know, all it takes is this, a step of honesty and of saying, God, I want, to, I want to know that I know you. Amen. And each one of you... Uh, I like to look at this group and think, man, I'm preaching to the choir. But allow God to touch your heart. Allow God to stir your heart. You know, we don't want to keep this secret. We need to tell the story. I mean, isn't it a great story? A wonderful story. Well, a marvelous story. And we need to share it. Let's pray together that God will give us the boldness to make a stand in these last days. And that we'll let our lights shine and let Jesus shine through us. Amen. Karen. Oh, my. And what's the last name? Cam Gammerman? Gammer. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray, guys. Father, we lift this family up to you. We ask you, Father, to surround them with your love and your grace, your strength and support. And we just thank you for that, Father God. And, Father, I pray that you'll touch each one of our lives. And I pray that, Father, you'll enlarge our vision, that, Father, we'll be able to focus not on the problem, but on the greatness of you, that we'll be able to trust you, that, Father, that we'll be able to focus on the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the love of God, the kindness of God, and all these special ingredients. And I pray that you'll kindle a fire in us, Father. I pray that you would open the windows of heaven and pour your spirit out upon us and give us boldness, give us wisdom, give us direction, give us insight. And I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the privilege of meeting together. And thank you, Father God, for just unfolding your word and enlarging our understanding. Go with us and, and direct our steps the rest of this day. Be with us as we come back for the revival tonight. And may your spirit move with freedom and liberty and may you touch people's lives and i thank you for it and we just commit our lives to you give you the praise in jesus name <coughs>